told someone I had uh, more joy uh, getting ready for this message than I've seen in a while. I have a lot of joy getting ready for messages, but I've really, really, really enjoyed this one. Perhaps it's the time in which we're living. I titled it, A Verse to Leave On. We're going to focus on one verse out of the book of Revelation. So you can begin turning there. It's Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. You know, when you begin reading the book of Revelation, you get to chapter 4, you have begun at chapter 4, the third and final section of the book, as outlined by Jesus himself. He told John, and we're going to look at that, verse one, chapter 1, verse 19, is the outline of the whole book. But last week, uh, we were in chapter 3, and we went to the last of the seven churches, seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, and John is instructed by Jesus to write to those churches. We looked at the last one, which is Laodicea, and it's a wonderful church to look at. Many say that is symbolic, uh, represents the modern church, perhaps uh, more than any of the seven. Uh, It was the church which was lukewarm neither hot nor cold, and Jesus was very um, upset at the uh, actions of that church and counseled them to come to him. And so when you get to chapter 4, it's a, it's a very crucial passage. It's critical. It's a critical verse in the book of Revelation. It literally trans, transports you. It's a transporting verse. It takes you from earth to heaven. The seven churches are on earth and the church age, but chapter 4, John hears a voice, he sees a door, and it says, come up here, I'll show you things which must be hereafter. And so it's a transitional verse, we'll look at that, and it's backed up. Uh, If you continue to read in chapters 4 and 5, John, who was writing to the churches on earth in chapter 3, now in chapter 4, sees the church gathered with the Old Testament saints in heaven. And they're all assembled. They're assembled around the throne. And Jesus in chapter 4 is presented as the lamb, the lamb that was slain. Can I get an amen? He was the only, he is the only one worthy to open the seven sealed scroll. And so you see this play out in chapters 4 and 5. All of a sudden, the church that was on earth is now in heaven, assembled around this throne. And God is, and, 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 and we see these visions, uh, of rapture, visions of glory around the throne in heaven. In chapters 6, it it changes again. The focus comes from heaven back to earth. But there's something missing. The church is missing. From chapter 6 all the way through, towards the end of the book, the church is missing. Uh, The focus is on the earth and what's going to take place during the tribulation. In chapter 19, that's from 6 to 18, the tribulation. In chapter 19, you see Christ returns to the earth. And by the way, in chapter 19, there's another open door. And this time, the armies of heaven are with Christ coming back to earth. And so that's in chapter 19. In chapter 20, we see the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. And then the great white throne is set up, and all the lost dead stand before Christ and are judged. And then chapter 20 uh, is about this millennium. It's about this great white throne. Chapter 21 through 22, that's the chapters of eternity. Those are the chapters of heaven as we think about it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that's just a quick overview of the book of Revelation. It's not that difficult. No one's going to say amen. Amen. I think that's why I'm excited about it. I'm starting to get it. What you need to understand, and that's what this message is about, this one verse, what you have to understand is um, that to miss this verse, to misunderstand this verse, um, you won't get anything out of the rest of the book. This is a critical verse. It's crucial. Uh, It's crucial to understanding the rest of the book, but it's crucial to remaining 
hopeful during the hard times. How many going through a hard time right now? How many need something to hang on to right now? How many looking for something? You know, I see preachers preaching messages. They name it, claim it, trying to lift people's spirits. Well, I want to tell you, our hope is not in anything other. Our hope is in nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And that's what the book of Revelation does. It gives you that. It gives us what we need. And this verse is crucial to understanding that, but also crucial to understanding this present crisis. I believe many today feel as if they're in a storm, a raging storm, and the ending is uncertain. We cannot see the end. J. Vernon McGee wrote this, and this is, I'm trying to turn your attention to this valuable book. I'm a preacher trying to preach hope to you, but I want to tell you, I'm going to come to you from the Word of God and let the Word of God give you the hope that God intends for you to have. There's no need to fear. There's no need to live in a state of unchecked fear because God's got a handle on this. J. Vernon McGee, one of my favorite preachers, I quote, he said, early in my ministry, I was a single man, and on Sunday nights after the evening service, I would go to bed and I would read a good mystery. About 1 o'clock in the morning, I would get to the place where the hero and the heroine are in trouble. The heroine's tied to the railroad tracks by the villain. Old number 77 is coming down the tracks, going to be there in about 20 minutes. The heroine's in a desperate situation. And I think that the hero of the mystery is going to save her. But I find out he's in the warehouse down by the pier tied to a chair under which is a stick of dynamite with the fuse already lit. Well, I can't leave at this point. No way I can go to sleep at 1 o'clock in the morning in this kind of position. But since it's time for me to turn over and go to sleep, I just slip over to the last page. And a different scene greets me there. There's the hero and the heroine sitting in the yard. I see a lovely cottage encircled by a white picket fence. They're married now, and they have children. A little baby is playing on the lawn. What a wonderful, comfortable scene that is. And so then I would just go back to the place where I'd stopped reading, and I would say to the hero and to the heroine, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know all the details, but I know this. It's all going to be okay. And that's what the book of Revelation is. God has got this. It's dark out there today. This is not to say that we're not disturbed by what we see going on, but the book of Revelation is all we need to know that God has got a handle on this. I can't think of anything more positive and hopeful today than to share Christ with those who are lost and to preach Christ's imminent return to we who are saved. He's coming. One day, he's coming. As we look at this one verse, I want you to see first the importance of this one verse. Revelation 4, verse 1. The Bible says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be Hereafter. It's a transitional verse. I want you to notice the phrase in chapter 1, uh, in, in, cha in verse 1 of chapter 4, the, the verse begins with, after this. Say amen if you see that. After this. And it ends with the word hereafter. I've underlined both of them in the outline, if you have one. In the original language, they tell me these words, these phrases are exactly the same. After this and hereafter, the exact same phrase. And this is not the first time that we've encountered this phrase. If you went through the Bible study with us, you remember in chapter 1, verse 19, the book is outlined using this same phrase. 
Uh, John says that he heard the Lord Jesus say, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. There's that word again. John's commanded to write three different sections. The first is the past, what John had seen. The second is the present to John, but as we'll see in a moment, it's still present for us because it's the church age. In the write the things that are, which is chapters 2 and 3, the past was chapter 1. Give me an amen. Chapters 2 and 3 is the second section, the things which were and are at the time of John and he writes to the churches. Well, how many believe the church is still on earth today? The church is still here. And those seven churches, though they were literal churches in Asia Minor, they represent all of the church age. We still study. Last week we looked at Laodicea and we heard the Lord's rebuke. Can I get a witness? And he still speaks to his church and the church is on earth. And so what was present for John is still present for us. The church... Age is still open, and people are able to come to Christ. And so you have this basic outline. But now, in chapter 4, John is in the section of the hereafter. These are the things that are here after. And so what's he talking about? Well, it's very important to see this. It's the third section of the book. When he says after these things, what's he talking about? Well, it's the things he was just speaking of. It's the churches and the church age, chapters 2 and 3. And so these are the things. Chapter 4 and on is what's going to happen after the church age. Now, how many remember the times of the Gentiles prophecy? That we uh, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, these things are going to happen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you there's a day coming when the door of grace is going to close. No one knows when that is. But that's what chapter 4, verse 1, is all about. It's an important verse. You can't miss this. It signals a time of transition for all of those who belong to Christ. And we'll see in a moment how it connects with the rest of the Scriptures. It's after the church age is closed. And by the way, we're talking about what the Apostle Paul called, the ch called to the, uh, the church at, uh, when, when he was writing to Titus. He says, this is the blessed hope of all believers. I want you to look at Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And the Apostle Paul himself expresses it this way. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What's the blessed hope? The rapture of the church. When Jesus appears, when Jesus comes. Is that your hope this morning? The next significant event on God's calendar is to come get his church. He's going to come get us, and he's going to take us out of here. Someone says, well, rapture's not in the Bible. I can preach on that, but I'm not going to waste my time. Grandfather's not in the Bible either. How many got a grandfather in here? Can I get an amen? Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, the snatching away is expressed in the Bible. So the church is going to be taken out of this world. Uh, when the rapture happens, several things are going to happen in succession, in rapid form. And that's what Revelation 4 verse 1 transitions us to. From this present time to when that succession of events begins to happen. So I want you to see. Let's connect the verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Now you all you just hold your finger on verse 16 because we're going to be going back and forth. I'm going to connect all of this to that. How many know what these verses are? Say amen if you know. We're talking about the Apostle Paul preaching to the church at Thessalonica who had given up all hope who had turned, throw, throw, thrown in the towel, and he, and he preached. Aren't you glad Paul preached this to the church at Thessalonica so that we could know this? For the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then he goes on, verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Verse 18, he's going to say, comfort one another with these words. Well, friends, I want to tell you, if all I had to look forward to was a tribulation, there wouldn't be a lot of comfort in that. Amen? But we're looking forward to the blessed hope, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's the first thing that's going to happen. A succession of events happens at the rapture, and then the Spirit of God is going to be taken out of this world. Remember? These are the things which are going to happen hereafter. But this is all preached by the Apostle Paul all through the Gospels. Now, I want you to notice first, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Listen to what Paul says. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's a, that's a riddle. Amen? It's kind, of, it's kind of a riddle. So I want to go to the New English Translation. I want, to, I want to unpack this. I want to make sure you get it. Don't miss this. This is very important. Let's go to a more modern translation to, so you can understand. Listen to what he says. For the hidden power of lawlessness is already at work. How many can see that around the world today? It's a secret. It's a secret power. It, it's not, they, they work under the cover of darkness. And that's how lawlessness works. And boy, are they, it seems like the devil's having a heyday. But don't you worry, God is still in control. And he predicted this, the mystery of darkness, the mystery of iniquity, of lawlessness is already at work. Now notice this. However, the one who holds him back, who is it that holds the devil back? God is, and the Holy Spirit is in this world, and he restrains that. Now, notice what Paul says. However, the one who holds him back will do so until he is taken out of the way. At the rapture of the church, the church is snatched from planet Earth and so is the Holy Spirit of God. He who restrains is remain. Can you imagine the chaos that's going to be? Can you imagine? How many Christians are there in this world that know Christ? I wouldn't want to be on an airplane flown by a Christian pilot. Unless I was a Christian too. Or else I knew how to fly a plane. When the rapture happens, a succession of events are going to happen. The church is going to be taken out of this world. The Spirit of God is going to be taken out of this world. There's a third thing. This sinful, rebellious world is going to be plunged into a horrible tribulation. You write it down. I gave you the brief outline of Revelation. Chapters 4 and 5 is a glorious scene of the church in heaven, but then comes chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Verse 1 and 2, when I saw the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. Thunder happens when a storm's about to come, amen? And this is thunder on the earth. I heard the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is not the same white horse of the Lord Jesus. This is the horse of deception. This is the Antichrist, and he's coming to conquer. And that's how the sixth chapter opens up. I want to skip to the twelfth verse of the sixth chapter. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal. So that was the first seal in verses 1 and 2. The sixth seal is opened in verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Not only thunder, now we got earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of, of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountain, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, 
and who shall be able to stand? Ladies and gentlemen, there's a horrible time coming for this earth. But God has given us the message we need. The church is going to be leaving. The first verse of chapter 4 is a transitional verse. It stands not only as a verse of transition, but it stands as a type. John is a type. Come up here. I will show you things which must take place hereafter. That's the third section of the book. Uh, it's a picture of what's going to happen when Jesus returns for his church. And I want to ask you a question. Are you ready for that day? That's the other message I'm to preach. Not only to preach to you this blessed hope as called by the Apostle Paul, but also to preach to you an imminent warning. He's coming at a day or an hour that no man knows. And when he comes, you had better, there will be no time to get ready. You must be ready today. Matthew 24, verse 44, the Lord Jesus himself, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. So that's uh, the importance of the verse. Now I want you to see the illustrations. <clears throat> what, would there, what kind of sermon would it be if it had no illustration? Amen? Uh, you have to understand it, and sometimes the best understanding standing is a picture, a word picture that helps me see what God is trying to say. Back to verse 1 of chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. The first thing I noticed is what John saw. He says, I, I see this door opened in heaven. Now, I want you to know, uh, David Jeremiah said this, and, and I've repeated it several times. There's only two times in the book of Revelation that a door is opened in heaven. Once is in chapter 4. And the church is caught up to heaven. And the second one, I believe, is in chapter 19, when, when the church comes down with Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? Heaven is a walled city. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to talk about walls today. But I want to tell you, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're not getting in. If you don't know Christ, you're locked out. And you can complain and all, all you want. But the only entrance into heaven is through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. And the door is only opened in Revelation twice, once in chapter 4, and another when Jesus comes back to the earth and the armies of heaven follow him. Look at Revelation 19, verses 11 through 14. I think they have that. And I saw heaven opened. Here it is. And behold, a white horse. This is the... This is the White horse of Jesus, the true one. Remember, the deceiver has already come. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he, he doth judge and make war. Wait a minute, I thought Jesus was kind and friendly. Well, he is, but the age of grace is done. Now he's coming to destroy. He's coming to take over. I want to tell you, he has a name by which no one knows. And his eyes are like fire. And he's got a sword, and he's coming to take over. He's not coming to take sides. He's not Democrat. He's not Republican. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he rules the world. His eyes were as a flame of fire on his head were many crowns. He's the king of kings, of all kings. And he had a name written that no man knew. Why? Because we only know him as the as the suffering servant, but one day he's coming as the conquering king. No man knew but he himself. Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Notice what they're wearing. These are the white garments promised by Jesus. Remember in Laodicea? You, they couldn't see their own nakedness. They need to come to Jesus and he'd give them white raiment to cover them. These are the true followers, the true believers, the church of Jesus Christ. Raptured in chapter 4, 
coming back to earth with him to rule and reign in chapter 19. But not only do I notice what he saw, we're connecting all this to the scripture, to the gospel which Paul preached, which all the preachers preach. Not only do you notice what he sees, but what he hears. Go back to chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard, was as it were of a trumpet, talking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Trumpets, he says it was a voice that sounded as if it were a trumpet. I, I don't, you know, perhaps the trumpet will blow, but maybe what God is saying, it was such a sound you couldn't mistake it. But it was as a trumpet as it were, but it was a voice. And he says it was talking with him. Trumpets were very important in the life of Israel to communicate. Had to go back and look at this. Numbers chapter 10 gives you all the detail. But they would use trumpets to sound the alarms. They would use trumpets to blow the call. Uh, they would break camp. Uh, the trumpets were blown when it was time to move camp. The trumpets blew to announce sacrifices on the feast days. The trumpets blew to summon the priest to the tabernacle. The trumpets were used to sound an alarm in time of war or danger, whatever crisis was about to happen. And it was very important that the people listen to the trumpet blast. And it was, very, it was even more important that the trumpeters blew the right sound so that they could understand what it was. <laughs> but you know, the trumpets are spoken of in the New Testament in the Bible, especially concerning the prophecies concerning the end time. And the Apostle Paul is the one who used them the most. Back to our verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Now we're connecting it. For the Lord himself, this is the rapture. He says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. Say amen if you got it. In chapter 4, verse 1, John says, I looked, I hear a voice, which as it were, a trumpet talking with me. It tells me to come up here. That's symbolic of the church being raptured into heaven. He said it happened at a voice and at a trumpet. Everyone heard the sound. The apostle Paul preaches it. The Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I got a good imagination. I believe when Jesus comes, the trumpet is going to call us who are alive and remain. Sure it will. We'll, we'll all hear it. But it's the shout of Jesus that's going to raise the dead. I can back it up in Scripture. Every time Jesus shouts in the New Testament, somebody comes back from the dead. How many remember Lazarus in the tomb? Been dead four days. I love the King James. He stinketh. He's dead. He, he's already decaying. And Jesus shows up and he shouts, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? This cat came out with grave clothes dangling off of him. When Jesus shouts, people get up. And so this is all included right here in our gospel, right here in the very messages we preach. And we need to be encouraged as we see the days grow darker. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. I just kind of like the word trump. And the dead in Christ are going to rise. i got to put something in my throat here. <coughs> Don't miss the illustration. Not only did Jesus shout at the tomb of Lazarus, how many think about the Easter story with me when he was crucified on the cross? And he shouted. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. He died. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked. And the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. 
and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And out, out of the graves, they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared. He will shout at the rapture. And the dead in Christ are going to come up. The trump of God. We who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the air. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about anybody else. I can't speak for nobody, but I can speak for me. I'm kind of looking forward to that day. It gives me great encouragement. The importance of the verse. The illustrations of the verse. Just those words connect. All throughout the gospel, the trump of God, the voice of the archangel, all these are what Paul preached. And I want to tell you, when John says all this is going to happen in the hereafter, it means after the church is gone. This is the transitional verse. I want you to, I'll close, and I listened to the radio today, good grief. That's a long-winded preacher last week. You know, they let me preach all the way through, though. They didn't cut me off. Thank y'all. The importance of the verse, the illustration of the verse, the implication of the verse. What's implied? What is it you need and I need today? What's the implication for me right now? I want to tell you, there's a lot. This verse not only speaks of a transition... From earth to heaven, this verse speaks of a deliverance. And we need that. John is told that he's going to see things which must take place hereafter. It's future. These are future events. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to be long until this world wakes up and finds itself. The rapture has happened and they're going to find themselves in the place of Revelation 6. And it is too late. I got stirred up when I begin to study for this. The first thing I do is I listen to sermons, and I listen to several. Max Licato, how many know Max Licato? Church of Christ preacher. He preached one that got me all excited. This is how he said it. I'll try to quote him, but he's, he's a little more refined than I am. But he spoke in my language. He looked at that church in San Antonio, Texas, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I got bad news. There is a bad dude a coming. Now, for Max Licato, that's, that's the first thing got my attention. That guy's talking redneck. I got some terrible news. I know the Bible, and I've read it, and there's a bad dude a coming. And his title is the Antichrist. But here's the good news. The church is going to be leaving. And the title of that is called the rapture of the church. And that's our encouragement. That's where we're encouraged. It's the implication of chapter 4, verse 1. It speaks of a deliverance. It's significant that John is called up. He's caught up. And he's told to come up and he's rescued into heaven before God ever opens up the book to the tribulation. Have you caught that? Before God gives him the bad news of what's coming, he tells him, get up here. The rapture of the church is nothing short of a rescue mission. God is rescuing his people. And he's going to pull his people out and he's going to pull his spirit out. And then he's going to break off all diplomatic relations with this world. And then, and then he's going to declare war on all the sinners and all the sin. Every time a country goes to war with another country, that's how they operate. Amen? They get their people out. They break off all diplomatic relations. And then all hell breaks loose. It's the same principle right here. God has got to judge sin, and he will. But there is no purpose for his people to be involved in that. 
another, con- we're going to connect the dots again to the gospel message. And I could go through many places to this point up. There is no reason for the church to go through the tribulation. By the way, let me give you another hint. I, I seem to have missed this. Um, let me go back. But in chapter 4, uh, up until chapter 4 of Revelation, the word church is all through the scriptures. Chapters 2 and 3, there's letters to the seven churches. But in chapter 4, which begins the third section, the final section of the book, you will never see the word church again until you get to the end of the book when he says the spirit and the bride says to the churches. In other words, it's an invitation to receive Christ. Why? Because the church is no longer on the earth. Check me on that. From chapter 4 and forward, you don't see the church on earth again, but you do see in chapters 4 and 5 the bride of Jesus Christ in heaven with him. Significant. Significant. It's the importance of the verse, the illustrations of the verse, the implications. Perhaps this is the most important. God's going to rescue his people before all of this happens. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, I want you to get this. This is gospel. This is part of preaching the gospel. How many, we, we just saying, he will, we're, we're covered by his blood. God will what? Pass over us when he sees what? The blood. What does that mean? Um, that we're all sinners. We all are guilty. We all deserve death. But because of the blood, because of God's own Son who gave his life on Calvary, because the blood covers our sin, God's going to pass over us. It's the preaching of the gospel. Well, let me say it in just another way. When we're talking about a tribulation, the most horrible of all times of earth, God's going to pass over. He, he's going to do more. He's going to rescue us out of here. Chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The wrath that is to come is for those who have rejected Jesus Christ. For those who know him, God is going to snatch them out of this world. Now. Billy Graham was preaching at the University of Hawaii. He was talking about this, the second coming, preaching it, the rapture of the church. And one of the students came to him afterwards, and I quote, said, Mr. Graham, doesn't this matter of the rapture of the church seem like escapism to you? I love Billy Graham. He replied, son, perhaps it does. But I want to tell you, before Satan gets through with this old world, we're all going to be looking for the exits. Amen? God's going to provide that for his people. I asked Mike, called him this morning. I don't know what time. It's, I said, Mike, I know you got the song service already, but can you include what a day that will be? Jim Hill wrote that song. I don't know Jim Hill. I just thought it would sound smart if I mentioned his name because I looked it up. He titled it, What a Day That's Going to Be. There's coming a day when no heartaches will come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, a glorious day that will be. Father, I love you. I thank you. I pray your encouragement and your strength upon your people to focus on this and not what's in the world. Keep our eyes on you. And Father, 
just as Dr. McGee would go to the end of the mystery so he could gain some comfort, so he could sleep, so too, Lord, we've went to the end of the story and we've read the final chapter. And Lord, we pray for your peace. The peace which passes all understanding to guide us, direct us, and keep us, strengthen us so that we could be what you called us to be. we got a job to do, Lord. It's not time to roll up our, and our cots and whatever, Lord. It's time to roll up our sleeves. There's a lot of work to do until you come. And so, Lord, I pray your church would be energized and lifted until the day when you come and snatch us out. And until that day, what a glorious day it's going to be, but until then. Lord, keep us and guide us. Give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you're here this morning, you need Jesus Christ. I tell you, times are getting short. I don't know what you're waiting on. If you have any doubt in your mind at all, maybe you need a church home. Maybe you need, I, I don't know, but the Holy Spirit is with us. One day he's going to leave this world, and we need to go with him. Amen? We go with him. But if you have a decision to make this morning, make it now. Today is the day of salvation. If you know someone in your family, tell them now. Um, we don't have to be like Aunt Esther on uh, Fred Sanford, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, thump them with something because uh, the times are getting short, and we don't know the day or the hour. Brother Mike, lead us. God bless you. Come if you need in Jesus' name.